Ideal gases, individual loss. Now we are going to talk about how the properties of an ideal gas change if you change some other property. In this section, we're just going to be covering two properties at a time and holding all others constant. In the next video, we'll get into what happens if you change more than two properties. The temperature, volume, number of particles, and pressure of a gas are all related to each other. If one changes, one or more of the others must also change. In this video, we will be looking at them in pairs, changing one, seeing the effects in another, and keeping the other two constant. This will also be all conceptual material. I think that it's simpler to do the math problems if you first learn how to combine all of these laws into the ideal gas law and work your math from there. So we're going to be covering all example problems for all of this section after this video, after we discuss the ideal gas law. Now, before you move on in this video, I have an assignment for you. I want you to go to the address shown here and play around with the simulation a bit. Hold some of the variables constant and change some of the other ones and see if you can guess what is gonna happen before you play with the sliders. Once you've played with all of the available sliders, come back. Now that you've had a chance to experiment, let's define each of these a bit more systematically. Note that in each one of these relationships, there's a different name. I'm not particularly picky about you knowing the names of them, just know the relationships and be able to answer the conceptual questions and then know what the graphs look like. I think that that's more important than learning who discovered them. So first, we're gonna take pressure and volume. As the pressure of a system is increased, the volume is decreased. Think of what happens if you press on a piston in a tube. So think about perhaps a closed off plastic syringe. As you increase the pressure on the system by squeezing the plunger down, the volume is decreased. So you can feel the pressure increase as the plunger resists against the change. Now mathematically, we say that P is inversely proportional to V. Of course, this changes if you change the number of moles or temperatures, but remember, we are just looking at pressure and volume right now. For each of these relationships, we are also going to look at graphs. We know the relationship between pressure and volume is an inverse one, so we can sketch a graph of what this looks like. And here, I have this on the first graph. In science, we often like to have graphs that are linear. We can do this by graphing P versus the inverse of V, which is a handy trick to know that scientists often do. Now we are going to look at two forms of Charles or Gay-Lussac's law. This one has two names because it was originally determined by Gay-Lussac, but Charles was the first to get it more prominently known. And so there is a bit of a battle about the nomenclature. Now, if you've ever gone camping, a nice, the nice fluffy kind of camping where you bring an air mattress with you, you've probably experienced Charles Law yourself. You get to the campsite around one in the afternoon, you set up camp in the midday, 75 degrees and sunny. Everything looks comfy. It's like you have your own personal hotel out camping. And then you go to bed. The sun drops, it's nighttime, and now you're sleeping on the cold hard ground because your air mattress has completely deflated. You check it for leaks, but there's none to be found. What happened? An air mattress is a good approximation of a stable pressure system. As the temperature goes down after dark, the volume starts to fall. Or in other words, as temperature decreases, volume decreases. Or as temperature increases, volume increases. Mathematically, we say that this is, means that volume is proportional to temperature. Going back to our piston system, we can look at this the same way that we did Boyle's law. If you decrease the temperature, the atoms are no longer pressing on the piston with as much force. This means the volume will shrink. If you increase the temperature, you increase the speed of the particles, increasing the force that you put on the piston and forcing it upwards. We can graph this as a straight line. Increasing temperature increases volume. I wanna take this graph one step further and combine it with the Boyle's Law graph. Think back to what happened when we increased the pressure. What did increasing the pressure do to the volume? Increasing the pressure lowered the volume. So if we look at this graph that was graphed with 0.5 atmospheres and we increase the pressure to one atmosphere, what would you expect to happen to the volume? 
it would go down. And if you pick any one point on the graph, on the 0.5 atmosphere graph, and you move down, you can get to the one atmosphere line. Or if you move down even further, you can get to the two atmosphere line. So we can, given this graph at 0.5 atmospheres, also graph it for each of the higher pressures. And I think that this is a valuable graph for you to know as well. A similar principle is at play if instead of holding pressure constant, we hold volume constant. Much like we use the air mattress to mimic the last one, we'll use tires to mimic constant volume. It's an approximation, of course, since we know that tires can expand and contract slightly, but it will work. In very cold climates, if you were to fill up a tire to maximum pressure while the car was cold, and then you were to start driving, the friction from the road would heat up the tires. This heat would expand the gas and the tires would burst. It's why if you ever have looked at your tire inflation pressure, it's actually reported as cold inflation temperature. So stating this more simply, as temperature is increased, pressure is increased. As temperature is decreased, pressure is decreased. Mathematically, we say that pressure is proportional to temperature. We can graph this as a straight line. Increasing the temperature increases the pressure. And I saved the easiest for last. If we increase the number of moles in an expandable container, what will happen to the volume? Think about a balloon for this one. If you increase the number of moles in the balloon, the volume will increase as well. If you decrease the number of moles in the balloon, the volume will decrease. The balloon makes a good approximation for it since its pressure is constant based on the atmospheric pressure. Of course, making this mathematical in language, we say that volume is proportional to n. We can graph this as a straight line. Increasing moles increases volume. Now that we've talked through each of these in detail, spend some time on the simulation again. Don't move on until you know what it will happen if you change any one slider. Remember to hold all but one constant. You should be changing one and one should be changing based on your adjustments. The rest should be constant. Let's click quickly review each of the relationships. Our pressure and volume are inversely related. So if we increase pressure, our volume will decrease. Our volume in moles are proportional. So if you increase one, the other will increase. Our temperature and pressure are also proportional to each other. So if you increase one, the other will increase. And then finally, our volume and our temperature are proportional to each other. So if you increase one, the other will increase. And please make sure that you can replicate each of these graphs. In most of the cases, it's simply a linear graph. The pressure and volume one was a bit different because it was inversely related. We were able to make it linear by instead on the x-axis of using v, using one over v. Now a quick comic to remind you of a very important topic that will come into play as far as not getting silly points marked off when you make these graphs. So it says, I think that we should give it another shot. And it's, it's a stick figure guy and girl who are in a relationship. And then she says, we should break up and I can prove it. She has a graph and it says our relationship and you can see it slowly going downhill. And he says, huh, maybe you're right. And she says, I knew I could convince you with data. And he says, no, I just think that I could do better than someone who doesn't label her axes. So silly comic, but hopefully this will help you remember, always, always, always label your axes when you're doing these graphs. Otherwise, we don't know what you're graphing and it's not correct.